you would, open to Philemon. You're probably already there. Uh, and we're going to dig into the book together. Uh, before we do, let's go to the Lord uh, again in prayer. Father, uh, I am grateful, Lord, uh, to be able to preach your word tonight. Um, I'm thankful, Lord, but also humbled uh, and recognize the uh, the weight and the responsibility of proclaiming your word. And so I pray, Lord, um, again, that your spirit would help me. Lord, um, empower me, help me to rest and rely on you and you alone, Father. And I pray that your spirit would speak to all of us tonight. Uh, teach us, Lord, your truth from your word, Lord, the truth from this wonderful letter. And I pray that we are all encouraged and strengthened by it. Thank you. We love you. In Christ's name. Amen. All right. So Philemon, um, a couple weeks ago, I did just a little bit of an introduction, um, really getting into the letter and kind of just doing that, that base work that I would do in like a Bible study. Um, it was very informal. We looked at just the letter itself, who it was written to, all of the kind of, I hate to say boring details of it, but you know, for lack of better phrasing, um, just kind of the facts of it uh, and really what to look forward to tonight. Um, so most of you are aware of kind of where we're going. Um, if you're not, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the situation. So we have this tiny little letter nestled between Titus and Hebrews um, that is really awesome. Um, I, I will admit to really before this year, just kind of reading through it very nonchalantly or just kind of going through it and not really ever stopping to give it the same kind of study that I've given books like Hebrews or Ephesians um, or you know Hosea, some of the Old Testament books um, that we've been doing in our Sunday night classes. Uh, I've never really given Philemon that much time, and I think I'm the worst for it um, because after going through it and studying it and really... Uh, spending the past, what I would say, a better half of a month just taking this book in. Um, I love it because it gives us a different side of, not a different side of Paul, but just a, a side of Paul that we haven't necessarily seen. Um, we typically get the theological giant in a lot of his letters. Uh, I, I love in, I think it's First Peter, where Peter's writing about Paul's letters, and he's like, look, they're really hard to understand sometimes. And so, like, if Peter is saying that, it's like, okay, well, I don't feel bad for myself. Um, Paul is a, a theological giant in his letters. Um, he's brilliant. And, and what we get in Philemon is not a lack of brilliance, but it's, it's the practical outworking of the theology that he has been teaching us. In his letters, uh, and I think that's why I like it uh, because you see an older Paul, uh, a Paul who is in prison, but a Paul who is living the very thing that he preached to his churches. Um, and that's beautiful. Uh, so when we did the introductory lesson, we kind of broke it down in a character study uh, in a way. We looked at really the three main characters of the letter and kind of their situation. One uh, is the runaway slave, Onesimus. Two is the wronged master, Philemon. So Onesimus belonged to Philemon, ran away. Uh, we can presume both were not Christians at the time. Okay, so Onesimus runs away. Uh, he runs away to Rome where he meets the third character, uh, who really is the spiritual father in this letter, Paul. Um, and while meeting Paul in Rome is converted, uh, Paul brings him to Christ. And we can also presume that before he brought Onesimus to Christ, he brought Philemon to Christ um, and, and taught him either at Colossae or met him in Ephesus just through some study that we had talked about in our previous lesson. And so you have Onesimus, Philemon, and Paul, and Paul is writing this to make a plea to Philemon for reconciliation, to bring home the runaway slave to the wronged master, who are both now brothers in Christ, uh, and to see them reconciled together and and um, and joined together once again. And so, um, one through three is Paul's standard introduction. Uh, I'm just going to what we're going to do, and kind of my plan for tonight is really to take uh, this section by section. Uh, I have 
And I promised you in the last lesson that we would look at this in two main relationships to really get at what I think is the heart of this letter. Um, the first relationship is Paul and Philemon. What's their relationship like? What is the, dyna- the dynamic there? Uh, how is Paul appealing to Philemon? And, and what are the things that he's asking for? And how does this you know, kind of flesh itself out in the way that maybe we ought to live to one another? And the second relationship is Onesimus and Philemon, a little more dicey. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at that, and that's kind of how I want to break it out. So let's look at Paul and Philemon first. Uh, and I, I've kind of, in just my own notes, titled their relationship Partners in the Faith, because uh, that's what Paul calls Philemon. That's probably what they considered each other, but they are partners in the faith. And so kind of skipping one, two, and three, we're going to start in verse four. And uh, what I want to look at really in 4 through 7 is what I think is, is Paul's joy in Philemon's service and, and the joy that he has in his character. And so let's read it together. Verse 4, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And so the first thing that we see Paul expressing is a thankfulness for Philemon. Um, I, I have to believe that Paul has the biggest prayer list in the history of the world. Like in every single one of his letters, he is always thanking God and expressing his thankfulness and letting the church know, you know, whoever he's writing to, just how thankful he is to them and just how much he thanks God when he remembers them in his prayers. Like he's, I mean, granted, he's been in prison for a while now, and so he's got time, but his his prayer list has got to be a mile long. Um, but I, I love that because he's taking time to actually bring to mind his brothers and sisters who are serving to the ends of the earth and to thank God for their ministries, to thank God for what they are doing in in the churches that they have established for their spreading the gospel, for their loving the church and serving them, and for Christ being made known uh, through their ministries. And and I have to I have to say, and I'm what I'm going to end up doing in a, most of this uh, in bringing it to application is uh, showing a lot of my cards. Um, and who I am and my, my faults as a person. Are we ever mindful of our brothers and sisters when we pray? And I mean like the scope of who we have met and known through life, who we, you know, maybe have not spoken to. Um, I, you know, I'm in an immediate context. I'm grateful for, you know, the people on the worship team and thank God constantly for them um, because they are a blessing to me. And I, I can't tell you, what I would do or where I would be without Beth and Steve in the back, without these guys, um, I would be lost as a worship leader. Um, they have helped me along and helped me grow so much in this position. Um, but to stop to think about Dr. Bobby or maybe a Charles McDonald, uh, maybe a Philip O'Quan every now and then, and just to thank God for bringing them into my life and knowing them and how they blessed me, that's something that I, I will admit has it's a shortfall in my life, um, and I, and I don't I don't want to just presume that my sins are your sins, but knowing people enough, you know, I think we would all agree that actually taking the time to stop and to think about the people over the history of your life, kind of that looking back, like Van had preached Sunday, to look back and to see all the people that you've come across and how God has used them to influence and affect your life, to help you grow spiritually and to just thank him for him. It, you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, Philemon, I stopped and I prayed for an hour for you. I, I just I thanked God for you and made mention of you in my prayers. I mean, do we do that? Are we mindful? Uh, and, and Paul is, and I think it's such a wonderful example that he's giving um, of just expressing thankfulness for his brother's service to Christ. Um, and, and the second thing that he does in this section is, uh, in his prayer, he prays that Philemon's ministry would grow. Okay. It's, it's the church of Colossa is thriving and the, the saints are being refreshed and loved and served. 
But Paul wants more of that for the church. He wants uh, that Christ would become even more visible through Philemon's life, through the church ministry there. Uh, he, he's not, he, he doesn't express any kind of jealousy over Philemon's ministry. Um, I have a friend who's a worship leader at Bethany, uh, of all places. Like, that's a huge ministry. And, well, thinking about it, it doesn't really prove my point because I'm not jealous. Uh, that's way too much for me to handle. I'm not capable of that. But, needless to say, like, we, we ought not be jealous of other brothers and sisters when they are doing things that seemingly get more attention, get more praise. Uh, other people seem to gravitate towards them rather than to us in our ministry. We ought to be thankful that people are hearing the gospel and being loved and served wherever they ought, like wherever they may be going. Um, you know, our home group is eight people strong. And I mean that, like strong. You know, people are being loved and served and we don't have to have the 50 people there, the 25 people there. God has blessed us with the group that we have, and there's plenty of ministry to be done, whether it's to eight people or to 50 people. Uh, and, and I'm grateful for that group of 50 because it, it, it's a place where people are obviously going and being fed and feeling like they belong and having relationships. And the gospel is being taught, uh, and people are growing in Christ, and that is not something to be jealous of. That's something to be praised and to be thankful for to the Lord. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I don't know that that is you in particular, but just a, a, a prayer that all of the ministries that are happening in New Covenant Church would thrive and grow. And, and that people, uh, the people who are leading those ministries would be strengthened, would continue in their service, would uh, make Christ more visible through their life. Um, that's what we want of our brothers and sisters and what we want of a church body. Because we want to support each other and love one another and, and to see the ministries that God has blessed us with grow uh, and thrive. And, and so that's what that's what Paul's praying for. He's expressing ultimately, uh, to sum it up, just a joy in in what Philemon is doing and in his character and is is deriving, as he says in verse 7, much joy and comfort from his love. And not just Philemon's love to Paul, but Philemon's love to the church in Colossae. He's getting joy from that and, and comfort that uh, the, the brothers and sisters in Colossa are, are, are being loved and served so much. Uh, and that, that's a wonderful thing. Um, so getting into now uh, kind of the meat of the letter. So we see Paul's joy for Philemon's service, and now Paul makes an appeal to Philemon. And, and really it's an appeal in love. Uh, let's read verses 8 through 20 together. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, and sending my very heart I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord." So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So this is Paul's appeal in love. uh, And it's an appeal that ultimately wants to see Onesimus reconciled with Philemon the runaway slave brought back to his wronged owner. And, and there are three things really that I think Paul is seeking uh, in verses 8 through 20. One, I think he is seeking to do what is right. Two, I think he's seeking to do what is best uh, for all parties. And then thirdly, I think he's seeking to be refreshed uh, a little more in Christ. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to those. 
Uh, so one, he, him, him seeking to do what is right. Uh, and, and this is in verse 8. You know, he says, uh, that, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. And so just to get down to the very plain understanding of this, that we are talking about slavery and servanthood uh, and servitude, and it's not something that we or the Bible uh, condones or uh, is okay with. You know, we are not celebrating it in any way, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that this is a reality that they're living in. It, it is what was a prime part of the world and the relationships between people groups in this region was the relationship of master and slave or master or servant if they were paid. Um, and so there's a legal obligation in play. There is a, a duty for Onesimus to be returned to Philemon. He was his property. He ran away. And under Roman law at that time, he was to be returned. And he was to be returned understanding that Philemon could do whatever he pleased with his slave because he was considered his property. And, and Paul knows this. Uh, Philemon knows this. And Onesimus knows this. And I think that what we have to understand is that just because they're both believers now, because they're both Christians, doesn't mean that that legal obligation goes away. If anything, I would say that that legal obligation is now heightened because they're believers, because they especially want to do what is right. Um, I think a great passage for this is, is Romans 13 uh, and going into 14 of Paul teaching them to just obey the laws of the land, to walk rightly in the government to be an example of just being a law-abiding citizen uh, and, and doing the right thing um, as long as it doesn't you know go against the express commands of scripture but you know that's not what that's not what's happening here um, there there's a responsibility that Onesimus has to go back to his owner and to make things right to uh, bring restoration to the wrongs that he's done along with his repentance and I think that's something that we may forget these days is that uh, when we see people repenting in the New Testament, um, I think of Zacchaeus uh, for one instance, like he repaid his debt, like he repaid robbing people like threefold. There was restitution and, and, and restoration of the things that had been taken in the sin. Um, repentance, you know, is certainly a, a spiritual act of turning away from our sin, turning towards the Lord and, and forsaking the sinful lifestyle that we lived. But there's also something that comes along with it of, of doing the right thing and making restitution for what we've done. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, uh, Richard Owen Roberts, who came, uh, several years ago, um, preached on that very same thing and, and gave example after example after example of men whom, after he had gone and preached much like he did uh, at our church of just, you know, several day um, series, uh, he would preach and men would come to Christ and they would come and, you know, express repentance and, you know, confess to him sins that they had done. Uh, one, you know, stealing from his boss and Richard Owen Roberts would say, okay, well, you need to make that right with your boss then. If you truly trusted Christ and repented, give back. Turn yourself in, honestly, because what you've done is illegal. Turn yourself in. He said these men would just look almost dejected, like, I thought that all I had to do was just you know, express this repentance verbally, and that was it. He's, you know, and, and it is point, and I think the point that Scripture teaches is that there's so much more to repentance than that if it's true and if it's genuine, that there's restitution that goes along with it and there's a desire for us to want to make that right. Um, you know, there's an obligation there. And, and there's also, you know, we're talking about the obligation that Onesimus has. Um, as a Christian, as a slave now, and to return to his owner, there's also a obligation and a responsibility that Philemon has to accept his brother who is repentant. If his, although he's his slave by law, if Onesimus comes back to him and is repentant to him, we see time after time in the scriptures that the responsibility of the one who was wronged is to forgive and to accept his brother back. 
And that's the responsibility that Philemon has because there's probably hurt feelings here. And, and this is not a situation, you know, Philemon was likely embarrassed by it. He was likely stolen from. Um, we've taken, taking that from, you know, verse 18. Um, you know, Onesimus has wronged him greatly. And, and it may be hard for Philemon, you know, to take him back graciously um, and, and to forgive him and to be reconciled. But it is his gospel responsibility now that he is a believer in Christ. Uh, there is no wrong that someone can do to us that doesn't merit our forgiveness when they're repentant. And, and I think, and we'll look at it when we get down uh, to Philemon and Onesimus' relationship, but the gospel is our foundation for that. And, and I'll flesh that out you know, much more later why, but the, but the gospel is the foundation of why we forgive our brothers and sisters when they wrong us and that we don't harbor bitterness uh, and anger towards them. And so he wants to do what's right. Paul wants to do what's right and to see them um, back together again. And ultimately, I have to believe that they both, you know, well, since they were reconciled, that they both wanted to do what was right as well. Uh, the second thing that Paul is seeking to do in this passage is to do what's best. Um, he wants to do what's right, but he also wants to do what's best for both of them. Um, and I think that's why, really, he, in verse 9, says that, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. So he's appealing to Philemon out of love and, and wants to give him the opportunity um, to do something graciously and of his own accord. Um, and ultimately, you know, what Philemon may not know at this point is that the best thing for all parties involved was for Onesimus to be returned to him and for them to be reunited and reconciled. Um, because it, it would be a very testimony, a, a living testimony of the gospel that they preached. You know, Onesimus was out serving Paul and preaching the gospel in Rome. Philemon is serving the church at Colossae and preaching the gospel. And so they're preaching a message, and this is an opportunity for them both to live out that message and to reconcile with one another. And, and that, even though, even though Paul knows that it's going to be hard for him, you know, he says that I'm sending you my very heart in verse 12. It's going to break Paul's heart to send Onesimus away because that's his child in the faith, but he knows that it's best for all parties that he go because it's right, because it gives a testimony of the gospel. And ultimately, I think because Paul knows that God's hand is on this situation. He makes mention of that. In verses 15 and 16, he says, For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. But Paul is basically saying, how much more beneficial is Onesimus' service, is his love going to be to you, Philemon, now that he's your brother in the Lord? Now that you guys are united in Christ together, how much more beneficial is it for you? Because you're not going to have to worry about him running away. Uh, His service to you uh, is going to be heartfelt and genuine, and you two are going to have a different relationship now. It's not the master and servant. Now it's the brother and brother in Christ. You know, there's an equality now that's brought to the table because of the gospel and because of what Christ has done for them. And, and that relationship now is going to have a chance to be on display for people when they're reunited. And what Paul is saying also is that, that God is always sovereign over our relationships. And the events that transpire within our relationships, he's sovereign over those too. And God could be, Philemon, using those past hurts and things that happened for a greater purpose. And, and for a greater good and to show his glory more. Consider that. You've been wronged by a brother or sister. You have a, a hard relationship with someone. They've wronged you in a certain way, or maybe you've messed up and wronged them in a certain way. Could not the sovereign God of the universe be using that to bring you two to a point of reconciliation and to show his love for you in Christ by displaying your love for one another and your reconciling. Could it not be that those hurts and events in the past lead you to a place of, of appreciating and understanding the gospel in a deeper way by reconciling 
with a brother or sister in Christ? I think it does. I think there's, there's something about the love between Christians that is unique and powerful. And it doesn't mean that we don't sin and hurt each other, but it means that we have an obligation and a duty and should have a desire, most of all, to reconcile with one another. It doesn't mean that we have to be best friends and hang out all the time and and go back to how things used to be, but it does mean that we have to come to understanding that there's forgiveness there, there is still love in Christ there, and there's still a union there, and that hurts need to be confessed, sins need to be repented of, and forgiveness needs to be had. And doesn't it make the gospel all the more real to us when we experience those things? It does, it does for me to see the gospel at work in my life and to take these, these very lofty theological ideas actually played out and applied to life in very practical ways makes me understand them more and appreciate them more. And, and I thank God for those things. And so consider that as Paul is speaking to Philemon, you know, uh, this is perhaps why he was parted for you for a while. Maybe God's at work. And being cheeky, he's, he's not. Maybe at work. He is at work. He is sovereign over the event. Understand that and, and seek to do what is best and what is right. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think that by appealing to Philemon in love and and not just uh, commanding him to do it, which he was could have been right to do. You know, Paul is an apostle. There is a situation that has not been reconciled um, for one reason or the other, and and Paul would have been right uh, to command them to reconcile together. But again, doing what's best, he wants to give Philemon out of consideration, an opportunity to act graciously on his own free will, on his own accord. I'm appealing to you out of love, and I just want to give you the chance to do it on your own, to reconcile with your brother. Um, or he could have just kept Onesimus with him, but he didn't. And in not keeping him with him and in not appealing to his apostolic authority, he creates the perfect scenario for there to be genuine reconciliation. Um, and, and I think that is an important thing to see here is that Paul is, is being considerate. Um, he is being loving in that consideration and giving both men an opportunity to come back together on their own without having to force their hands. Um, and ultimately, I think that this is the most glorifying option. It, it is the most glorifying to the Lord that both men come back to each other on their own. Uh, if there's if there's a, a force of hand there, if there's you know an, an apostolic command, there's always the question of, of genuineness. Uh, but in this way, Paul is doing what is absolute best and most glorifying to the gospel. Um, and then thirdly, Paul just acknowledges their their partnership in the ministry, and and I think I, I love that Paul does this because he's he's Paul the apostle, and he's very well known at this time. Uh, it's not a mystery who he is. He's established several churches all across uh, the Roman Empire at, by this time that he's writing this letter, and and he's a giant, like we said. But Paul levels the playing field in regards to both of their importance in their gospel mission. Because of the cross, because of who they are in Christ, both are equally important in God's mission. And I think that's especially important for us to understand in in our current uh, day and and our ministry positions is that we're we're all equally as important to God's mission, whether you're, well, nobody's going to be an apostle. uh, And if you are, you should talk to Brother Keith. Um, Nobody's an apostle, but you know whether you're the pastor or worship leader or associate pastor, whether you're an elder or whether you clean the building, whether you greet people at the door, whether you help print things out in the back for services or organize Thanksgiving meals, all are equally important in God's mission. Because there, you know, we'll kind of mention it later. There's there's no partiality in God. There is no ranking of importance in as far as, you know, who gets what rewards and what crowns for being in certain positions. God calls us each to different things because we're a body 
and bodies have different parts and functions, but all are equally important, and the body cannot function without one of its members. And Paul, again, displays that here. Um, it's, I hate for it to like sound like a brag on Paul letter, but, but he, he really is like, this is the prime example of him saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Like Paul is imitating Christ here, and, and I think it's commendable to imitate Paul here in, in understanding you know, that he is relating to ultimately someone who is submissive to him as an apostle. He's relating to him as an equal because of the cross, because they are equal ultimately in the mission of God. Um, and, and that, I, please don't miss that. Um, and I think that that has implications, especially for those of you, and, and I'll just say those of us who are leaders. When we speak to those who we are leading and, and we want them to do something or we're trying to communicate just a goal or a vision, we, we ought not be speaking to, I keep saying ought not, we should not be speaking to them as if they're just a cog in our awesome you know, ministry machine. They're equally important to the goal. Like I said, I, I could not lead this church effectively without the team that I have and that God has given me. Like all are important. I, Sue came back for the first Sunday in a long time and like I have missed her so much. And like we have been wanting because she's been gone. She sits in the back and plays the keys, which you may or may not hear, you know, depending on just their volume and, and sings backup. But even in just what would seem like a, a very, you know, behind the scenes role, she is incredibly important to us and, and adds so much when she's here. Um, we shouldn't speak as leaders to people like they're, you know, Again, just cogs in our machine. They are, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ and deserving of the same dignity and value and worth you know, that we feel we should have because Christ paid the same price for all of us. And, and nothing that he calls us to do is ever less important than someone else's calling. Um, and Paul is displaying that here. Uh, so again, he he's appealing to do what's right. He's seeking to do what is best. And lastly, Paul's seeking for some refreshment. Uh, and I love that, actually. I love that he says, I want, in verse 20, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Like, refresh my heart in Christ, please. Like, give me, like, lift me up. Encourage me. Uh, you know, really, really make my day, Philemon. Um, and, and, you know, it... He's making it clear just how much of a blessing uh, his acceptance of Onesimus would be to him. And, and in the midst of that, though, you know, and I think what we kind of catch in 17 and 18 um, is that, you know, Paul is lovingly reminding of Philemon um, of his duty and, and his debt and how even in reminding a brother or sister of their duty that they have in Christ, that's not an unloving thing to do. Oftentimes it can be very loving because oftentimes we forget what our duty is and what is the right thing to do. And, and so Paul is reminding him, you know, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Um, and, and, you know, says that if he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I will repay it, um, which I actually think is an awesome uh, point to Christ, that, that Christ pays what we owe God um, and, and he charges that to his account. Um, and then he says, you know, I'll repay it to say nothing of you owing me. Like, you've got a duty, brother. You've got an obligation and a debt that you owe. Don't worry about it. I'll pay it. But you have a duty to accept this brother back. And I know that it seems maybe like Paul is kind of playing that forceful hand a little bit. Maybe that there's manipulation is too strong of a word, but that he's kind of like lovingly, forcefully reminding like a parent would like, hey, I love you, but if you don't do this, I'm going to spank you uh, type of deal. Um, but I, I really do see this as a loving reminder that we all have responsibilities and we all have duties as Christians. There is nothing contradictory about joy and obedience. It should be joyful obedience. There's nothing wrong with duty and delight. They, they go right alongside one another and and we, we have to understand that. And I think that if you read, you know, again, one of Paul's best, like Ephesians, if you read Ephesians, you know, he, he sets up 
the whole first half of the letter, you know, giving us who we are in Christ and what Christ has done. And it really, you know, gives you that strong implication of what your duty is. And he spells that out in 4, 5, and 6. But while he's doing it, he tells you what a delight it is to actually obey Christ and to live for him in light of what he's done for us. You know, don't, don't think that duty and delight contradict in any way. There is a lovingness about being reminded of, of what we should do because ultimately we should find pleasure and joy in doing what God commands us to do. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's the mark of Christianity that is so different from other religions is that they're, they're doing and striving in order to gain acceptance and love from their God, but we already have it. And so we strive and work and walk in good deeds out of love. Out of love. We, we love him because he's first loved us, First John. And, and you know that, that, I think, is what Paul is getting at the heart of. But to get back to him being refreshed in Christ, you know, he wants to be encouraged by Philemon. And, and I think that it, it, it serves to point out at this point that it's okay to desire to be encouraged and refreshed by other Christians. Like that's something that we should expect when we come into this place to be encouraged and strengthened. Um, because again, that that is our duty and our delight is to strengthen and love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, when we talk to one another, when we spend time with each other at our homes or in restaurants, um, there there should be this joyful expectation of like, I get to go see, you know, when Heather comes to the house, she is my wife's best friend in the world, one of my closest friends. And like, I know when she comes over, she's not going to leave the house and like leave us feeling drained. And like, what did we just get ourselves into? Like, we all feel encouraged and refreshed. It's the same when we spend time with the Cousinos or the Easterlies. Like there, there's something again about genuine Christian love that like leaves you wanting more of it because that's... Ultimately, what it is is the love of Christ being shown through someone to another person and God showing his grace to you through an ordinary person. And, and the love that is expressed, uh, 1 John even says that you know nobody's ever seen God. And then he goes on to talk about how if we just love one another, and, and what he's getting at is that when we love each other as Christ commands us to love each other, we're actually seeing the Lord. Uh, and it's a, it's an incredible thing, but the way that people see God in the world is by the way in which we love one another. Um, and we'll read a passage from John in which Christ is essentially saying the very thing uh, and establishing that from the get go that you know the world will know who I am by the way that you love each other. Um, and so it you know Adair and I had this group of friends before we came to New Covenant that. Looking back on it now, I see it, but we didn't at the time. Um, professing Christians, and every time we would hang out with them, there was just always, I don't know, we were friends and got along, but there was always something off. And like when we would leave their presence, it was just like, an, it felt like we'd been drained emotionally. Um, like it was just a lot of effort, and you know, sometimes conversation would try to go places that it should not go with Christian couples. And, you know, she and I both recognized it and, like, approached each other about it at the same time um, and ultimately ended our friendships with those people. Um, Fast forward years down the road, like, I don't know that all of them have forsaken the Lord, but they're certainly not in the church, not actively seeking. Like, I, you know, I just... But it makes sense to me now. Um, there There was something that was not genuinely Christian about the way in which we were saying that we were loving one another. Um, and, you know, I, and I don't know even still to this day really how to process that other than I know the difference between real Christian love and fake Christian love. I, I do. Like, you, you just, like, you experience the difference, and it's like, that's what it is. Um, it's never been that way with anyone in this church. And it's really one of the reasons that, like, we decided to join this church. And I've said it multiple times, but, like, we were bound and determined to stay at Central Bible Church. And we're going to come visit out of courtesy. And then we come and visit, and it's like this overwhelming sense of the love of Christ that was, like, it it was so tangible um, and something that Adair and I just were blown away by 
Like we walked out into the parking lot after the service and just looked at each other like, oh, we're going to leave CBC. <laughs> we're going to come here because that was, like, that was experiencing the spirit and, and experiencing the love of Christ in a group of people in just introducing themselves, making us feel welcome, uh, making us feel loved, although we had just met. Um, that's not in every church. And, and it's not the norm, um, and it has not been the norm in our lives. But you know the difference when you see it. And, and I think it's okay to desire that and to expect that when you, when you are in a body. Um, and I think that it's, you know, and to, to bring that from Paul, like, he wants to be refreshed. He wants to be encouraged and, and almost has this expectation of it. Um, because in the very next verse, he says that he's confident of Philemon's obedience. And so there's this like joyful expectation. That he's like, I, I know you, brother. Like, I, I know your heart. I know what you've been doing in the church. Like, I know that you're going to love Onesimus and be reconciled with him. Refresh me. Um, and and it's, it's a beautiful example and, and something that I would just say, it's okay to expect that in church. It's okay to expect that from brothers and sisters to be encouraged um, and on the flip side to also be the encourager um, and the giver of that, that joy and love. So thirdly, in this section of what we read, um, we're going to see Philemon's joyful obedience, um, that he does what is required and more than that. Um, verses 21 and 22, he says, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. And then at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Um, I think that this speaks to Philemon's character in that Paul knows he's going to do more than what he asks of him. And, and his response is not going to be begrudging um, because ultimately they're partners in the faith. And Philemon wants the same thing that Paul wants. Like their desires and their mind, if they're both seeking to have the mind of Christ, then they're aligned in this and, and they want the same thing. Uh, their desires are united. Uh, and so that, that's their relationship. That's Paul and Philemon's relationship. Um, equal, although there's an authority, um, we'll just call it a, an authoritative and submissive dynamic there. There's equality in the way that they relate to one another. Um, and that's important for later. Uh, so let's get on to, we'll hurry up a little bit, let's get on to Philemon and Onesimus. Um, I have titled their relationship forgiven and reconciled uh, because it's their relationship that I think ultimately gives us the foundation for all Christian relationships. And it's their relationship and what they're leading to that I think ultimately is the best picture of the gospel uh, because there are there are four let's just call them uh, principles or pillars of their relationship that that very clearly express the gospel to us. Uh, forgiveness, reconciliation, union, unity, and love. Uh, that's what they are expressing. And I'm going to do this for the first time. Oh, nope. I did exactly what everybody else does. They go too far and then have to back up. So, what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to bum rush you with a bunch of scriptures right now. Um, each one is going to have a heading, and, and it falls under those pillars. Um, and again, it's probably going to seem like I'm beating a dead horse, uh, but there's a point to it and something that I want to communicate. So first one, forgiveness. I'm going to give you several verses that, that really express God's forgiveness to us in the gospel. Ephesians 1-7. through he says, in him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And then Colossians 3, verses 12 through 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. That's forgiveness. The second pillar of Onesimus and Philemon's relationship is reconciliation. Here's the list of verses. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. I almost went to Brother Keith's famous, famous, favorite verse. Um, 
I'll let him do it when he comes back. Um, 5, 18 through 20. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. The next verse and the last one for reconciliation is Ephesians 2, 13-16. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and who has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. And his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. So that is reconciliation. And those are scriptures that are again reinforcing uh, God's call to us to reconcile. Thirdly, union. There's going to be a, a unity between the two. Romans 6, 3 through 5. Or do you who not, or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Galatians 2.20, one of my favorites. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And the last, and probably what Scripture calls the greatest pillar or fruit of the Spirit, is love. Romans 5, 8, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And 1 John 4, 9 through 11, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also love one another. Now I know, I know it seems like I'm beating a dead horse with the Scripture references, but what is my point? My point is that we have an overwhelmingly firm foundation in God's Word on how we ought to treat one another in light of what God has done for us in Christ. Period an overwhelming foundation from God's Word on how we ought to treat one another because of the gospel, because of what Christ has done for us, because He has taken upon Himself our sins on the cross, given us His righteousness, that He was, as 1 John says, the propitiation of our sins, that He satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf, and how we are adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God, reconciled to God loved by God, in union with Christ forever. That is the foundation of every relationship that we have. Every relationship that we forgive, that we reconcile, that we seek unity, and that we, most importantly, love each other. The gospel, and and write this down, please, the gospel is not just information. It's not just informative to you. It is transformative. It's not just to say, okay, well, you know, you said you accepted Christ as your Savior. Here's kind of the rundown of what happens now, and here's where you get to go, and 
you know, things are going to be great for you. No, it, it transforms you. You're a new creation. You, you put on Christ. You take off the old self. And therefore, every relationship you have, every conversation, every intention that you have or thought about another brother or sister in Christ is transformed by the gospel. It's no longer, what can I get out of this relationship? What is the best thing for me? It's having the other person's best interest at heart. It's considering someone else more important than yourself and seeking their best before your own and seeking to love them as Christ had loved his church. Um, that relationship, and, and that, is, that is what Paul is wanting to see in the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. And, and gosh, I want that for all of us. Um, I, I know so many relationships that are torn apart um, within families, within friend groups, over things that are not worth it, that are not as meaningful and as everlasting or eternal as the gospel. There's no reason, and I mean that absolutely, there is no reason to ever not be reconciled with a brother or sister in Christ, to forgive them. And again, I'm not saying you have to be best friends with them and go to you know, Six Flags on the weekend together. Like, But you do have to forgive them, and you do have to be reconciled, and you do have to seek unity in Christ with them, and you do have to love them. Um, there is no option there. That is our duty, but it should also be our delight. And, and I want that for our church. And honestly, I wish that 200 people were here to hear that. Because I don't think that I'm talking to the people who really need to hear it all the time. Maybe sometimes. You're not perfect. Uh, but I wish that our church was here to hear that. That our elder body was here to hear that. That our deacons were here to hear that. That that anybody who serves in any capacity or ever walks through the door should hear this. There's no reason we should ever be disunited as a body. Because nothing is ever more important than the gospel. Gosh, and that's why I love this letter so much. Um, is that it just, it gives the picture of that. I mean, this was... When slaves went back to their masters, you know, um, a good percent of the time they were killed um, because they were masters were socially embarrassed. They were angry. There was wrong done. They were killed. But to Philemon and Onesimus, being brothers in Christ, the gospel is so much more important than a relationship of bond servant and master. There's a mission there to display the gospel to the world through the way in which we love each other. And, and I'm just going to skip to the end. I, I have the, an application of, of authority and submissiveness. And, and I'll just say that, that both of those relationships, whether you're ever in authority or you find yourself in the submissive position, and I'm not just talking husbands and wives. I'm talking employer, employee, um, you know, ministry leader, uh, servants in that ministry, whatever it may be, parent, child, whatever, there's a responsibility that comes with both of those positions. Um, and, and I would actually say the one in authority bears the greater responsibility and is judged more harshly uh, for the way in which they carry out that responsibility. Um, but both of those things are God-given. Both of them carry great responsibility. And the driving factor behind both of them is not self-interest, but love. Ultimately, it is love. It is Christ-like love. It is sacrificial. It is demonstrative, meaning that it is meant to display something publicly to people, basically the gospel, and it is impartial. And I, I think pointedly for us in the South, Christian love is impartial. Um, Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I could go to James to beat the horse more, but we've done that enough. Christian love does not divide on lines of race or politics or socioeconomic lines or name it whether or not you love Alabama or LSU. It doesn't divide on those lines. 
he doesn't even see those lines. Christian love, the love of the gospel, is that all of those distinctions that we use to identify ourselves go to the background and disciple goes to the top. Christ lover goes to the top. And that is how we identify ourselves first and foremost. And so everyone else who identifies themselves in the same way gets the same love, the same dignity, the same respect, the same everything. And again, I, th- I think this letter displays that um, beautifully um, because it, it does really give us a good practical view of Paul and his love for both of his children in the faith and all of them. Because if you read in Col- Colossians, the letter of Colossians gets delivered by Onesimus. So he does go back. And the very fact that letters were read publicly when they were delivered, um, you can take it with certainty that um, Philemon was more than happy to reconcile with his brother because there's no way he would have let this letter be read aloud or circulated to all the churches if he didn't. Um, So they did. They reconciled and showed the gospel to all those who witnessed that. And we should praise God for it and seek to do the same in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for um, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, and that it is our good news, our hope in this life. Lord, the thing that we cling to when we feel lost and wondering at times, Father, and thank you that it is also our foundation of all living, and that you teach us, Lord, so thoroughly in your word how we ought to live with one another, how we ought to relate to each other, and and how we ought to love each other. Father, um, I pray that you would work in us as a body, that you would work in the people of New Covenant in our hearts, that we would seek to be united with each other, that if there are hurts and wrongs, that we would seek to be reconciled, that confession and repentance would happen, Lord, and that there would be forgiveness. And that we would have unity in Christ, Lord, and that the love that we display towards each other and share to one another would be a testimony to everyone who sees it, that Christ is Lord, that our love for you is genuine and real, and that, Lord, you are worthy of our lives. Help us, Father, by your Spirit. We love you, and I thank you so much for this letter, and that we have it. And I thank you for the truths in it, and I pray that they would continue to transform us in one degree of glory to another, Lord, until Christ comes again. We love you and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Loving Christ, the media ministry of New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. If we can minister to you somehow, please call us at area code 225-664-0858. Until next time, get into the Word of God and stay there. This has been a production of New Covenant Church, all rights reserved.